Welcome back. Uh, we're up to chapter three in our online trek through the universe, our, in particular the solar system. Uh, the big picture you see of me back here uh, is in fact in front of the Tycho Brahe Planetarium in Copenhagen, Denmark. I was there about three years ago and I was there on a grant doing some research on the guy named Tycho Brahe. We often just refer to him by his first name, Tycho. He's someone who will figure into our lecture today. So I thought I would show this photo, uh, but I'm not sure we really need to have me staring at me, staring at you uh, all through the time. So I'll, I will change this up a little bit for us uh, there, but I did want to share that with you. Uh, as we're going to take a little bit of trek through history, I thought maybe the Doctor Who box that goes through time might be a good backdrop for us along the way. Uh, but without any further ado, let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen in the appropriate way. And what we're going to want to do is go back to the beginning here so we can do a slideshow. Yay, we are up to chapter three. So we're going to be looking at scientific thinking and how that has been employed and how it has changed or not changed over the course of the past couple of thousand years. Astronomy is one of the oldest of the sciences. It's been around for as long as people have been looking up at the sky, which pretty much means for as long as people have been around. It aids in navigation, especially if you're out on the sea, how do you know how far north and south you are? East and west is a little bit trickier. We'll talk about that later in the semester. Uh, but how do you know when animals are going to migrate? How do you know when you're going to plant the crops? How do you know when the Nile's going to flood? How do you know when Easter and Christmas and other things are coming along? Astronomy is often part of, if not the entirety of, how we track these different kinds of things. For example, in ancient Central Africa, they could predict the seasons, and back then there were really only two seasons in Central Africa around the equator. You never have snow or anything like that uh, in, in the rainforest, but you would have a wet season and a dry season. Well, how do you know when the lakes are likely to dry up and how do you know when they're likely to overflow? Well, you watch the moon. And the thing is, as the moon comes up, it in a crescent in the sky will sometimes be like a smiley face. But sometimes during the year, that smiley face is a little bit more like this. And part of the year, it's a little bit more like that. As we've talked about before, our planet is angled and our moon is going around at a wobble as well. So between those things, they figured out the patterns that it tends to level off. Notice here in June. It also tends to level off here in January. So when you're leveling off and going in this direction, one season is changing into another, and when it levels off and goes in the opposite direction, that season is waning, and you're getting into another season. That is important, and that predates any writing. That predates cities, and that predates other kinds of things. This was stuff that people had figured out and passed on to generations uh, th simply through oral kinds of transmission. We have our calendar to this day still predicated on seven things that you can see moving in the sky, uh, the planets, as well as seven that you can see with the naked eye and seven days a week. Uh, the sun and the moon were considered part of those wanderers, although we do not anymore consider the, the sun and the moon to be in the planet category for scientific reasons. But uh, sometimes in English, we use Germanic names rather than uh, the, the older Latin names, but we have the day of Saturn, Saturday, the day of the moon, Monday, moon day, day of the sun, Sunday. Uh, so so, uh, so we, we talk about Mardi Gras in French, and um, we, we, we have Mars, Mardi, as the day for that. Woden, Woden is a, is a Jupiter, uh, uh, or a Mercury, and uh, Thor is uh, the Jupiter Thursday kind, kind of uh, thing. So, so we're still using these kinds of codifications. Ancient civilizations were good at figuring out how to measure time during the day, how to measure time during the year. They were monitoring the planets as they moved around. They move around in predictable cycles. They were able to monitor the lunar cycles of the phases that were out there. 
They began to predict eclipses. They were also good at monitoring stars. We, for example, start the new year when the calendar changes to January 1st. That is not typically when ancient civilizations would have changed their year. Uh, one of the year markers is the bright star Sirius, and at its what's called the heliacal rising. For part of the year, it's going to be below the horizon, but as soon as it sort of starts to come up, then the people in ancient Egypt would say, okay, it's coming up now, the Nile is going to flood very soon. Those two things seem to be related because they always happened at the same time, uh, and, and thus they were able to begin their year by watching that. When we look at obelisks, we have obelisks from Egypt in a lot of different places. Notice the shadow. If it's positioned correctly, it can be a sundial. It can tell you the time of the day. Now, there are obvious drawbacks. Uh, this isn't a very precise way of measuring time. It doesn't work when it's cloudy and it doesn't work at night. But the way people operated in time throughout most of history is different than the way we operate today. Everyone has a phone, everyone has a, a clock on the phone, everyone has, oh, I have to be there at 2.30. Uh, th those kinds of precisions were not regular in the ancient world because there was no way of telling time. Uh, if you show up this afternoon, if you show up this evening, you would predicate things on sunrise and sunset and noon when the sun was highest in the sky. Uh, so, so there were other ways of measuring time as well, but this was one of the key ones. And this would often be the central timekeeper for a town or village or a community of some sort. Uh, this one here, as you see, is in the middle of a plaza. Uh, we have uh, more obelisks in Rome than any other city because the Romans tended to pick them up and transport them back to Rome. But there's a major one in uh, Paris, Place de la Concorde, uh, where it's sort of in the center of, of things. There's a Cleopatra's Needle in London, which is an old obelisk. One of the oldest things in New York City is an Egyptian obelisk. We have obelisk-like things in the United States elsewhere. The Washington Monument is designed in this same kind of form. If we look at Stonehenge, it's not designed to tell you the time of day, but it is designed to tell you the time of year. Uh, I was just here in the last three months. Uh, I went with a study group from Ivy Tech on our, our alternative spring break, and we went here. They have markings on the ground that show you where the sun will come up and where the sun will go down on the longest day of the year and the shortest day of the year, and it goes between the different monuments that are set up there. In Mexico, in, in uh, Aztec and Mayan uh, geography and architecture, we see an awareness of where the sun and the moon and other uh, parts of the sky are along the way. We see that also in Native American uh, constructs, uh, their, their uh, uh, appreciation and awareness of the sun cycles is important. And one of my favorite ones here is the sun dagger uh, in New Mexico. Unfortunately, this one no longer works. But what happens is on the longest day of the year and only on the longest day of the year, the sun would come through and have this pattern show up. And that's because as you're looking at the cave, there's a stone and a stone and a stone and a stone. And the stones block the light, except for that one day a year when the sun is lined up properly and gives you this. Well, because of tremors and earthquakes, some of the stones have fallen over and we no longer get this. So there's a debate on whether or not it should be rebuilt or whether that's just something that's now relegated to history along the way. Do, what, what do we do to preserve things when nature takes its course? In Scotland, we also have this in other, especially Celtic areas, we have stone circles that are predicated on the moon. And the moon, as it goes around in its wobbly way with the different phases and everything, actually completes a particular cycle. And they'd figured this out 4,000 years ago. Again, Stonehenge was done before there was reading and writing. These stone circles were done before there was reading and writing. Uh, people were very aware of their environment and did things that there's no way that these circles are set up and just follow the moon by accident. We have some things that are still mysterious to this day. Uh, the the uh, Nazca lines in Peru, for example. Uh, we don't know whether these are meant to embody what the constellations were for the groups that were there, 
and the, thus they're depicted on the ground or if they have some other meaning. But they seem to be aligned with some patterns that would have been seen in the sky. Uh, Machu Picchu is very high uh, in the mountains. Uh, if you get to visit there, and I hope you do sometime, it's a really spectacular place to go. Don't be a hero, take the oxygen. Don't be a hero, take the, the, the mule train up and down. Uh, and and uh, so, so even if, if I was a mini marathoner, I was, yeah, yeah, it, it, it gets really high up there along the way. But it was very clear that the different things that are built there are structured in an alignment with the solstices, the longest day and shortest day of the year. In the South Pacific, we have this as a star map. Uh, how do you know if you're out on the ocean, whether or not you're headed towards Gilligan's Island or headed towards the Island of the Lost or if you're headed towards Hawaii or Australia uh, when you have no landmarks? Well, you figure out where in the sky the stars are that would be aimed in those directions. And the Polynesians in this area, again, before they had reading and writing, had star maps and star charts like this that would help them out in different ways. They became, again, very sensitive to their environment. 20,000 years ago, we have cave paintings in France that show lunar phases that were going on. So they, they were aware. And if you think about it back then, the only way you had light at night was when the moon was out. If the moon was not out, if it was a new moon phase, then it was dark, dark, dark. There were no golden arches signs. There were no street lights. And, and your fire didn't put out much more than just a little bit of light right here. Beyond that was just pitch black darkness. So a real awareness of where the moon is and how it cycle operates is in the, the evidence that we see from people in those ancient times. People in Native American cultures, people in Asian cultures, such as here in China, uh, were able to record different major events. Uh, we have supernova explosions that could be seen. Uh, you could read by it at night. You could uh, see it during the daytime. It was bright enough to not be obscured by the sun. Uh, the last known one that we had that was a major one that was like that was in the year 1054. Uh, so just about a thousand years ago. One of the earliest ones uh, is here uh, uh, 2,500 years before then in 1400 BC. And these tend to last for weeks, if not a couple of months. And we can see it started in one month and dwindled or faded away in uh, another month. So we here in the West and thus spread around the world, get our mathematical and scientific ideas predicated on what happened in and around Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Greece. And the, a lot of the numbers, a lot of the mathematical things come from uh, the, the ancients in the Mesopotamian region. We have a lot of ideas that germinated in the Egyptian region, but most things ended up being codified and put together for the way we think about things in the Greek uh, uh, culture. Even though Alexandria is in Egypt, it was a, a, a Hellenistic place. Uh, it, Hellenic, Hellenic and Hellenistic mean Greek and Greek-like. Uh, so, so the Hellenes are, are, are the Greeks. And after Alexander the Great conquered much of the Middle Eastern world, including Egypt, he kept setting up cities over and over and over again. And every time Alexander would set up a new city, he'd look around and say, what do you think we should call this city? And all of his generals and others following him say, what about Alexandria? And he'd say, good choice. And so there were a bunch of different cities named Alexandria. Sort of like in this country, lots of states have a Springfield and lots of states have a Bloomington. Uh, lots of countries have an Alexandria. Uh, because of that. But the greatest of the Alexandrias was the one in Egypt. It was right on the coast and it built one of the, uh, 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 what, what should be considered one of the wonders of the ancient world, uh, the, the great library. In fact, if you play Civilization, uh, the, the video game, and you unlock the wonder of the world, the library, library of Alexandria, you get knowledge from all sorts of other cultures. Because this was a place where lots of the books and scrolls and knowledge and scholars and scientists and poets and musicians and astronomers and mathematicians and, and biologists and others 
came from all around the world to study, to share, to research, and would leave their materials, at least copies of their materials, behind. There's a new Library of Alexandria that's been opened just in the last 20 years. A friend of mine went there a couple of years ago and brought me back a hat. I can't find the hat. I think it's back in my office, uh, actually. Otherwise, I was going to wear the hat for, for this lecture. Uh, but but uh, the old library is actually now underwater because this is a coastal city and there's been erosion and other kinds of things that have happened back then. I'm going to post up a video. In fact, I'm going to stop for a moment here and write myself a note uh, to post up a video for you uh, of the Great Library of Alexandria from Carl Sagan's Cosmos series. So you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, if I had a time machine, he says in this uh, video, this is one of the places he would go back to. And I agree. This is one of the places I would get into my Doctor Who box here and go back and see. Because you could learn so much from this old library, many of the books of which didn't survive, aren't, aren't around anymore, and we have no copies. But one of the things that they were doing back then is they were trying to model nature. They were trying to put patterns to things. As I mentioned before, if you figure out the pattern of things, you've figured out most of what you need to do. If eclipses come on a regular pattern, then they're probably not because the gods are getting mad and blocking out the sun for five minutes. Uh, so, so what they're doing is they're figuring out the tides rise and, 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 and ebb, and uh, they, they do that because of responses to nature, not because gods are pulling on them and pushing them away. Uh, they did think that the world that we're on was in the center of the universe. We call that the geocentric model. Uh, and everything revolved around us. Uh, that's not a bad way of thinking about things, because if you sort of look up in the sky, that's the way it is. I'm going to post another video for you, also from the same series, Cosmos, uh, where Carl Sagan talks about Eratosthenes. And Eratosthenes was a librarian at Alexandria, and he's the first guy to really measure the size of the Earth. And what he did was he figured out that on a certain day in the Egyptian calendar, at a certain place in Egypt called Syene, on the longest day of the year, nothing casts a shadow at noon. The sun is directly overhead. Remember we talked about directly overhead being the zenith? It's directly overhead. The water just shoots right down into the well. It doesn't have any shading or shadowing, so it heats up the water. And all the columns and pillars and everything, nothing casts a shadow. Well, north by several hundred miles, what we get are shadows. And he said, how can this be? If there's no shadow down there on the summer solstice, which would be for us June 21st, and up here in Alexandria on June 21st, there's a shadow. How can that happen? Well, that happens because the Earth is curved. See, people didn't think the Earth was flat until Christopher Columbus and then figured it all out. This was almost 2,000 years before Columbus. And not only did they figure out from Eratosthenes that it was round, that it was spherical, but how large it was as well. He was, came, with, came within 95% of being correct. That's an A, 95% is an A. Not bad for someone who just sort of hired someone to walk out the distance between the two. That would have been some walk because there weren't highways, there was no uh, uh, sidewalk, there was no Motel 6 leaving the light on for you. Uh, so that was quite something. But this was beginning to build up the types of knowledge that we have. And this was also the era in Greek intellectual life of philosophy. Philosophy back then, and really scholarship back then, wasn't divided the way it is today. If you were a scholar, you learned astronomy, you learned poetry, you learned history, you learned music, you learned mathematics, you learned science, you learned literature, you learned all sorts of different kinds of things. And they were all woven together. It's really a more modern construct that we separate things out and say, well, you're a psychology major, you're a biology major, and you're a business major, and stuff like that. That, that, that division is, is not something that happened back then. And when we look back at Plato and Aristotle and others, we often divide up their thinking according to our modern structures along the way, because there's just too much to study 
Uh, so if we're looking at this, remember all of this is related to each other. When they say the Earth is at the center of the universe, they're not just talking about it in terms of physically. They're also talking about it spiritually, religiously, philosophically, ethically. Everything is, is, is centered on the Earth. But the Earth is flawed. The Earth has different kinds of imperfections. However, up there, everything's perfect. The sun comes up and goes down every day. The moon goes around in its perfect form. Everything moves perfectly. Nothing changes. And if you have changes, they always decided that must be part of the earth. That must be stuff in the atmosphere like clouds and, 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 and stuff. It can't possibly be out in, in the heavens. And we still use that phrase to this day, the heavens. Uh, keep that thought in mind because it'll come back to haunt people. Now remember, we were talking about the last time. Sometimes we see the planets going back and forth in the sky. If we're looking at Mars, looking at Mars, looking at Mars, oh, a few weeks later it's gone backwards, a few weeks later it's backwards again, and then it's going and going and going. That all makes perfect sense if we're going around the sun. How does it make sense if we're having everything go around us? Well, a guy named Ptolemy came along and he put together a big book called the Almagest, which is a title which essentially means big book or greatest book. Uh, and, and he put together the Almagest, and it has been used for astrology up to this day. So astrology is actually about 2,000 years out of date in terms of this book. The thing is, this book used information that was as much as a thousand years old already. So astrology with regard to where the stuff is in the sky is 3,000 years out of date. They're still using the Ptolemy book here. But in fact, the main use for Ptolemy's book was to tell you where things are in the sky. And for 1,500 years, it still got an A. It was still roughly 90% uh, uh, accurate for, for a lot of things. But like any clock that runs slowly, the longer you're using it, the more off and the more off and the more off it was. So after 1,500 years, people began to figure out there might be an issue here. There might be a problem here. But one of the real problems was how do we explain these planets going backwards? Nobody back then had an idea really about gravity the way Newton did or the way Galileo did. We, and they weren't really trying to explain how things work. That was not the, the issue with, with Ptolemy. He just wanted to explain where things were. He was concerned about observation, not with explanation. Uh, and so what he said is if you take the planets and as they're going around the Earth, they do these little loop-de-loops. These loop-de-loops are called epicycles by the way. Uh, so we have a retrograde, a backwards moving loop. Then as that happens, as we watch it, it's mostly going in the right direction, but sometimes it looks like it's going backwards. And all the planets seem to do that. He could never quite explain, and again, this is not meant to be explanatory. It's just meant to show you where things are in the sky. The moon doesn't do that. The sun doesn't do that. Why do the planets do that, but the sun and the moon don't? Never mind, don't ask that question. That was not a question he was particularly caring, cared, uh, uh, interested uh, to answer. Well, after Ptolemy's time, uh, the Roman Empire began to crumble, the, the European civilization began to crumble a bit, but at the same time, over in the Middle East, the Muslim Empire was experiencing what we might call a golden age. They had universities, they had uh, libraries, they had the House of Wisdom. A lot of our university structures actually date back to some of the ideas that came from here. And they preserved a lot of things, including the Greek uh, philosophies of Aristotle in particular, and, and some Plato and Ptolemy's work. Well, after 1453, there were a lot of people who had sort of been still hanging out in the Eastern Roman Empire who headed into the, the West because it was beginning to crumble and fall, and they took with them the materials they had, also trade back and forth between the, 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 the Muslim groups and the European groups, which actually happened quite a bit. Uh, we talk about wars and crusades and other things, but we forget that there there's a thousand years here where there was back and forth trade, uh, which included uh, books and documents and other kinds of things. So the reintroduction 
of Aristotle and the reintroduction of Greek materials, sometimes through Constantinople and sometimes through the, the Arabic uh, uh, places like the House of Wisdom, uh, really spurred on new thinking. And one of the new thinkers was Copernicus. Copernicus proposed a sun-centered model. Uh, so we have a solar system, remember Sol, S-O-L, rather than a geocentric model. Uh, but but here, here's the thing about this. He wasn't the first person to do this. There was a guy 2,000 years before him named Aristarchus of Samos who proposed this as well. I think I mentioned that in the last lecture. Uh, so he proposed this, he put it together. One of the things that Copernicus did that Aristarchus did not, or at least didn't survive for us, that, that Aristarchus did, is he put the math to it all and published all the, the books. He, he published this big book called On the Revolutions in the Heavens. And actually, I'm going to pause here for a moment. Uh, let me stop sharing here and pause for a moment, because I have a copy of that book, and I'm going to show it to you. Well, unfortunately, I left that book in my office, so I thought it was downstairs, but it's not. But I do have this book called Cosmos, which is a different book called Cosmos than the one that Carl Sagan writes. I wish it would stop disappearing here on the screen. Uh, and in this book, it talks about the book that we have from Copernicus. And uh, Copernicus's book, let me see if it will have a copy of the cover here. Uh, interestingly enough, it's sort of right in the middle. So we have before and after in terms of the history of astronomy. Uh, Copernicus's planetary theory, as, it, as, as it's talking about here. Uh, and this is sometimes called the greatest book that nobody read. It's called On the Revolutions in the Heavens, and it was not only on the revolving of the planets, so the revolutions in the heavens, but it was also a revolutionary idea. And that's uh, sort of a play on words uh, that, that's there. Let me see if I can go back to sharing, sharing the screen with you here. Uh, Copernicus was a cleric. He was part of the church structure. There are many scientists who were and still are to this day. So it's a misnomer to think that religion and science never get along. But here's the thing. He published his book in 1543. Notice he passed away in 1543. That sort of saved him from getting into trouble, taking the earth away from being the center, because the church really didn't want to hear too much about that. But here's the other thing. As people were watching the planets go around the earth, and they were doing their little loop-de-loops according to Ptolemy, they were a little bit off and a little bit off and a little bit off, so that by the time we're getting into the 1500s, they were not just a few days off or just a few weeks off, they could be months off. And there were all sorts of attempts to try to adjust the calendar and make it work and all, all of this. So Copernicus sort of reset the stage with everything going around the sun. But here's the thing, it was no more accurate than Ptolemy's model. So it was a simpler design. Everything's going around the sun rather than doing loop-de-loops around the earth. Uh, but but it, it was also just a little bit off and a little bit off and a little bit off. So where, where's the great idea here? Well, along came a guy named Tycho Brahe. And Tycho Brahe is the guy I'm actually writing a book about now. So I could talk way too long about him. Uh, he was probably the greatest astronomer in terms of observational astronomy, looking up in the sky and seeing what's there and measuring what's there and where it is, who has ever lived. He lived in the generation right before telescopes. He died in 1601. Galileo started using the telescope in 1609, 1610, so missed it by that much. Uh, he observed a star exploding, the, the first supernova we'd had in 500 years. Uh, this is not supposed to happen in a sky where everything doesn't change. Remember that Ar Aristotle idea, that Aristotelian idea? The things up there are perfect and don't change? Well, uh-oh, that's a change. And he used that parallax trick that I taught you where you close one eye and move things to figure out that it was farther away than the moon. He also did a lot of his own astronomical instrument building. He went to uh, an island called Ven. He built his own observatory there. And 
without building telescopes, because we didn't know too much about the optics of, of lenses at, at this time, he built a lot of other kinds of things that made measuring much, much more precise. And he spent 30 years doing this, more than 20 years at that island and then several more years in another location. This graphic here shows one of his inventions. These people who are standing down below in the painting are life size. And notice we have a window up here at the upper left. You, this wall in his house is plumb north and south. It, it, it's directly on that line. And this was painted on the wall. So you could actually stand down here at the bottom and look out the window up there, or stand here at the top and look at the window there. Thus, you could isolate in the way that you might do with a telescope lens what you're looking at. He was anticipating the way you would operate a telescope. And you could look at anything from almost your zenith. You couldn't quite get the zenith uh, from here, almost all the way down to the horizon. Uh, and, and what you do is you let the Earth take you across to see the different things. And he did this night after night after night after night. And he could measure not down to the degree, but to the minute. So, so it, 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 it was incredible because remember we have 360 degrees and each degree, each teeny tiny degree is divided into 60 minutes. He was able to get down to one minute, one arc minute of measurement, whether it's left or right, north or south, up or down, all of those kinds of things. He still couldn't figure out the parallax. He still couldn't, couldn't detect the parallax of stars uh, that are out there. That's how he knew that Nova was further away because the moon has parallax that you can measure. That star did not. That says that star is further away. He hired a guy named Kepler when, when Tycho relocated uh, to a city called Prague, which is now in the Czech Republic. Kepler came along and he used all of these measurements that Tycho had been uh, compiling for decades to make some really revolutionary insights. Uh, he was a Copernican. Tycho was oddly not a Copernican. Uh, Tycho still thought that the Earth uh, was in the center of, of, the, the, uh, the, of, of the universe with the sun and the moon going around the Earth and the planets, the other planets, perhaps going around the sun. Or he had a couple of different uh, theories that were out there, but that, that was his primary one. Uh, Kepler, he wanted Kepler to help him prove that, and Kepler was like, well, no, nope, that's not going to happen. But one of the things that Tycho did is, regardless of what the ideas were, he made very accurate, hyper-accurate measurements. And when Kepler was taking those observations and putting them into the equations for circles, there was always something left over. There was always a mistake, always a mistake, always a mistake. But the thing is, it was always the same mistake. It was always this eight arc minutes. If it was different mistakes on different days, you might say, well, he, the vision was fuzzy, there were clouds, the, the equipment wasn't working right, but it was always, always, always the same mistake. Tycho doesn't make the same mistake for 20 years. He doesn't make the same mistake for 30 years from two different locations looking at these things. And, and it really was challenging because one of the things that Kepler really wanted was for things in the heavens to still be perfect, even if the sun was in the middle. And it turned out circles were thought to be perfect, but ellipses were not. Now here's the thing, here's how you draw a circle and an ellipse. If you have a thumbtack and a string and a pencil, you thumbtack the string down on one point, you tie the pencil to the other point and you go around. And it, the string is the same length all the way around. So that's your radius. So, so that's how you define what a circle is. Every point on this circle is the same distance from the point in the center. So over here, as you can see, we see that we call that an eccentricity of zero. There's no deviation. Every point all along the way is the same distance from this. Well, the way you draw an ellipse is you have actually two thumbtacks. You still have your uh, a string and you still have your pencil. But as you're going around, notice what you have is the same length of string, and it's a different, slightly different calculation, but the points are all in relationship to the two focal points. 
the further away they are, the more eccentric it is, the less distant they are, the less eccentric it is. Here's the tricky part. Take those two thumbtacks and put them together. Aha, see what just happened there? A circle is just an ellipse where the distance between the two thumbtacks is zero. Let me repeat that. A circle is an ellipse where these two thumbtacks have a distance of zero between them, which means, aha, if we take that circle equation and make it into an ellipse equation, they're related to each other very closely. Guess what happens? That eight arc minutes, that mistake that was over and over and over and over again, that was no mistake. That was telling us Kepler's first law, which in many ways might should be called Tycho and Kepler's law. The planets go around the sun in an ellipse, not in a perfect circle. The moon goes around us in an ellipse. That's why sometimes it's closer. We have a super moon. Sometimes it's further away. It's a mini moon. It's going around in an ellipse, not a perfect circle. And the sun is at one of the focal points, one of those thumbtack points along the way. The second law is as it goes around, when it's closer, it goes faster. When it's further away, it goes slower. All the planets do that. And as we look at the planets, again, Tycho's observations and Kepler's equations show sometimes the planets are going faster through the sky and sometimes they're going slower. That's natural when you're having this motion. They sweep out equal areas in equal times, which means if this is a month, this is a month. This blue shaded area is the same area. If this were carpet, this would match the same. If this were like 40 square yards, this would be 40 square yards. So they sweep out equal areas. If you started here at the perihelion, which is the closest point, and go to the aphelion, which is the farthest point, that's half the year. That half the year matches that half the year. So they work. And the further away the planets are, this just shows you a sort of another way you can sort of look at the time intervals going around in, in the speed. The further away things are, the slower they go, but everything is in relationship to each other by this very simple equation. I'm not going to throw a lot of equations at you, so don't worry too much, uh, but this is one of the ones p squared. Uh, that's the orbital period in years, so we would be one here. Uh, if, if you're sort of looking at Jupiter, it's a it's, uh, 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 little over 12, uh, or a little under 12, sorry, uh, years going around. Uh, by the time we get out to Pluto, it's 250, or 248, 250, close enough in, in astronomy. That's related to the average distance from the Sun in AUs cubed. Uh, so, so Jupiter is a little more than five AUs away. It takes a little under 12 years. 12 times 12 is 144. 5 times 5 times 5 is 125. 144 doesn't equal 125, but remember it's a little less than 12, so it's a little less than 144, and it's a little more than 5, so it's a little more than 125. It balances out, and that bit worked for all of the planets along the way. And the further out you are, the longer your year goes, the closer in you are. Mercury whips around in less than three months, 88 days, the faster you go. And that also explains how we're seeing the loop-de-loops, why things seem to be going backwards, because we are lapping them. Uh, the ones on the outside, all the planets on the outside do those loop-de-loops very easy to see. And we can represent that information graphically like this or graphically like this. There are all sorts of ways in which we can depict the same relationship of p squared equals a cubed uh, there. So all of this is explaining still, though, what you're seeing. It's not explaining why. And that, that becomes an issue for science. Uh, Tycho was an observational astronomer, and Kepler was a mathematical astronomer. But neither of them really qualified in what we would call astrophysics, because they both were trying to explain what's out there, but not so much why. It made a lot more sense for things to be going around the sun rather than being doing loop-de-loops uh, around the Earth. Uh, th that was more of a conceptual than a scientific kind of thing. Uh, there were a couple of things that the Aristotelians, who said, nope, the Earth has to be in the middle, uh, just couldn't let go of, though. 
and we actually still have a few echoes of that today in people who think the earth is flat and all of that sort of stuff. They said the earth couldn't be moving because we would be feeling it. You, why, why don't we have seatbelts holding us down if we're moving around so fast? Wouldn't things, if you threw it in the air and the earth was moving, why wouldn't it just sort of move, move over like that? Uh, they also didn't like the non-circular orbits because, no, nope, that's not perfect. Why are circles perfect and ellipses are not perfect? Well, that's a much larger question, but that's what they thought. And also, if the Earth were really going around, why aren't we seeing parallax in the stars? Why aren't we seeing them moving back and forth? Well, that would still become a, an issue really up until the 1800s uh, along the way. But one of the things that Galileo had at his command was the telescope. Telescope was not invented by Galileo. We have uh, most likely Hans Lippershe in the Netherlands was, was the first one to invent what we would call today a telescope, but he built his own based on descriptions. If you have 10 by 50 binoculars at home and you can get that for 1995, Celestron's an okay brand, Orion is a, a better brand, Mead is a good brand, uh, you have a better telescope than he was using. Uh, and back then. But one of the things he did was he did different kinds of uh, experiments. And one of those experiments will sort of foreshadow Newton's experiments of inertia. And that is that things in Aristotle's idea was that everything eventually comes to rest. Everything's natural motion is to be at rest. Galileo said objects actually stay in whatever they're doing. If they are already resting, they're at rest. If they are in fact moving, they tend to stay moving until something else acts on them to slow them down. The other objection was looking up at the, the, the sky. Well, Tycho already saw that supernova up there. Tycho also figured out that comets were a little bit further from the moon. Uh, because they had uh, a less parallax than the moon, so that says that they are further out. Uh, Aristotelians used to think that comets were like clouds or, or like lightning, that they were somehow in the atmosphere. Tycho said, nope, that, that's not the case, and that began to challenge the ideas. But when Galileo saw imperfections on the sun with sunspots, don't do this at home. When he looked at the moon and saw that it sort of had acne uh, and pockmarks, that was a problem. Tycho thought he measured some stellar parallax, but, but it, it, it really wasn't the case. That would have been an observational error. And he didn't really emphasize this. He, he sort of knew that was still a question mark uh, that's there. Tycho showed, especially with his telescope looking at the Milky Way, that it resolved into bunches of stars. They are much, much further away than parallax would ever let us. But here was the key. This was the key. And you can, again, with your binoculars, 10 by 50 binoculars, look at Jupiter when it comes up. And right now, here in June 2020, when I'm recording this video, in case you're watching this five years or 50 years from now, uh, in June 2020, you can go out in the morning and see Jupiter. And, and it is uh, sort, of, sort of before the sun rises. You'll see it. It's very prominent over in the east. Look at it with your binoculars even 10 by 50 binoculars, and you're going to resolve as many as four little dots around Jupiter. And what Galileo saw watching it night after night after night is these dots were moving. These dots were moving around Jupiter. This is his depiction of those things. And one of the things he saw is he would go out one night and there would be two dots. Let's say my head is Jupiter. So he would go out and there would be two dots over here. And then the next night he would go out and there would be two dots over here and one dot over here. And then he would go out a few nights later and there would be two dots over here again and over and over and over again. And he noticed that there was a pattern forming. Look, there's two and one here. There's two and one here. There's two and one here. Now there's three and one here, but now there are two and two here, but two and one, uh, two and one, two and one. We had that happening over and over and over again. So what he figured out was these are lights that are moving around Jupiter. Sometimes they're in front, so you don't see them. Sometimes they're behind, so you don't see them, but they're going around edge on. So sometimes you see them over here, sometimes you see them over here, and there are at least four of them because we see four different dots. And three out of the four are in sync with each other. Uh, we, 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 
call call that an orbital resonance, and we'll talk more about that later in the in in the term. But what was happening is one of them was going around every week. One of them was going around twice a week, three and a half days. One of them was whipping around every day and a quarter or so. It was going around four times a week. And they would all line up two and one every week. And again, two and one. Now, how did Galileo not just know that these weren't lights somewhere in front of Jupiter or lights behind Jupiter? How did he know they were going around Jupiter? Well, because Jupiter is something that moves through the sky. So as Jupiter was moving through the sky, we have two and one. And then when Jupiter moves, we still have two and one. And then when Jupiter moves, we still have two and one. They're moving with Jupiter. So they're going around Jupiter. We call these the Galilean satellites, these four moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Io, Europa, and Ganymede are the three that are going around in the orbital resonance one, uh, every week. And he figured this out. This is the first direct evidence that something is going around something else other than the Earth. Another observation that fulfilled this was if Venus was going around us rather than around the sun. As we're looking at Venus, you can't do this with the naked eye, but now you can do it with telescopes. Galileo can do it with telescopes. You can do this with good binoculars too. If it was going around us, the light reflected off of Venus would only ever let us see a crescent or a new phase, the dark portion of Venus. If Venus goes around the sun, while we're going around the sun further out, we'll sometimes see quarters and gibbous and full and crescents, just like we see on the moon. And guess what? When we look through those binoculars or telescopes, that's what we see. So the church at the time told him to shut the hell up. Uh, and I'm not picking on the church in particular here. Galileo is in Italy, so the Catholic Church was in charge at this point. Had he been in Germany, he would have been burned at the stake by the Protestants. The Protestants at this time didn't want to hear this any more than the Catholics did. Uh, so so uh, I'm, I'm not going to pick on the Catholic Church here uh, going up against Galileo. Uh, because it would have been in really any Christian uh, uh, institution that was trying to preserve power at the time, which was almost all of them uh, back then. But his books were put on the banned list. Uh, that only applied in Catholic countries, though. So in England and the Netherlands and various parts of Germany, his books were being sold everywhere. And most people then would, uh, who were interested could buy them and bring them back into Italy and France. And, and it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a major, major thing to have books uh, by him. Uh, they finally took the books off of the banned list in 1824, and they finally said, you know, he wasn't wrong after all. In 1992, only took 350 years or so to figure that out. Uh, so some things are slow to change along the way. But science is a long process. Science comes from the Latin word meaning knowledge, but not all knowledge is science. Poetry is not a science. Uh, there are other things that are not sciences. And, and this is one of the interesting things about talking about is it true or not. Religion can be true. Poetry can be true. Music can be true. They're not scientifically true. So we're often comparing not only apples and oranges, but apples and carburetors uh, when we're trying to think about, well, this doesn't match with that. Well, of course it doesn't because they're different types of knowledge. When we're talking about scientific knowledge. We're making observations. We're asking, why does it do that? Well, Ptolemy looked up and said, why does it do that? They must be doing loop-de-loops. Why are the planets seeming to go backwards? They must be doing loop-de-loops. Well, that predicted where the planets would be over time, and that made a lot of sense until we got better measurements from a guy like Tycho, and everything was off, and we had to come up with new hypotheses. Well, maybe it's not loop-de-loops. Maybe it's circles, as Copernicus said. Well, that also didn't quite work. So we had to go back. Okay, maybe it's ellipses. Aha, that worked. And that's what we keep doing. That's how science gets refined over and over again. Uh, sometimes we start just by looking and trying to figure out what we're seeing. Sometimes we follow our intuition. There is no one set way to start in terms of science. But when we're 
getting going on it, we always want to make sure that we are looking for natural causes. We don't have, okay, and suddenly God made a miracle here. That may be true. That's not science, in large part because you can't make it happen again. You can't explain why it would happen again. So just because it's not scientifically true doesn't mean it's not true, but you can't say, well, aha, because uh, yeah, it's like, no. We, if we're dealing with science, it has to be natural causes. It can't be the gods turning off the sun for five minutes because they're upset. We also need to create and test models of nature. It doesn't have to be experimentation per se, because we can't go out and experiment on the planets to figure out why they're moving back and forth in the 1500s and 1600s. We simply didn't have the technology and we didn't even have the telescopes back then. But see, here's the thing, and this is what we call Occam's razor. There's a guy named William of Occam who said usually, not always, not 100%, but usually, the simpler explanation is the one that makes sense. The simpler explanation is going to be the true one. And we had two things with Ptolemy and his loop-de-loops, and we had Copernicus and his going around the sun in complete circles. They were both 90 to 95% good at explaining where things are in the sky. They were both equally good. Well, one of them makes a little more sense just thinking about how things move than the other. Going around in a circle around the sun makes more sense than doing loop-de-loops. What's causing the loop-de-loops? How do you make things do that? We can't figure out really anything on Earth to figure out. You can't throw a ball and have it do those kinds of loop-de-loops along the way unless you have really particular kinds of spin and other kinds of that. That's just not likely to happen. So Copernicus would win with this, but that's not definitive. What you need to then do is test the predictions. And that's what Tycho and Kepler were doing. They were testing the predictions. They were testing to see whether the math of a circle would work or the math of an ellipse would work. And suddenly the math of the ellipse worked. When that worked, we, we abandoned the loop-de-loops and we revised Copernicus to say, okay, they're not in perfect circles. They are in fact in ellipses. This was actually a really big thing for Kepler. Kepler had this insight where he thought there are a certain number of what are called perfect solids. You have the pyramid and you have a cube and you have a sphere and others. And he said there, there are a certain number of perfect solids and there are a certain number of planets. And each of the planets should be nested inside of one of these perfect solids. He had this grand geometric vision of how the universe worked. And it all fell apart when you had to go with ellipses rather than circles. But Kepler was too good of a scientist to let his personal view be the guiding thing. He said, as much, as much, as much as I want these things to fit, I can't do it. It's not gonna work. And so that's how science is. You lay your personal bias aside and you go with the evidence. Uh, that's a good thing for us to think about in everyday society today because we have a lot of what's called bias confirmation out there. And there are a lot of people who, who tend to discount science because they think, oh, well, that just doesn't fit with what my opinion is. Science is not opinion. Science is testable. Science has to be testable. And quite frequently, we will make predictions, and predictions are not necessarily the science themselves. So as you're reading different things, especially as we read things about, say, the virus and how viruses change and mutate and other kinds of things, there's a lot of information out there. Some of it's testable, some of it's not. Some of it is, has been tested, some of it has not been. So watch for those different kinds of hallmarks and see. And sometimes things haven't been tested simply because we haven't gotten there yet. And we haven't had the time. Uh, this, this is a whole new situation that we're in. So we will sometimes make predictions based on what's happened before. And those are often useful predictions, but they're not always going to be 100% either. So we go back to Occam's razor, William of Occam. Does this make sense according to this over here? We're not always going to get 100% there either. And things develop and change over time. Just because we change the ideas in science and change our understanding based on new evidence 
doesn't mean we were doing things wrong. We were doing things as best we could in the right way with what we could understand at the time. And that's one of the critical parts of science too. So I will see you in chapter four.